Well, good morning. It's wonderful to see all of you, at least I can see you. It's a great joy for Teresa Honnold and me and Sharples, together with Steve and Abba Deering, our co-directors of music ministry, to lead BUC's worship service today. We welcome to our church people of all ages, all races, all abilities, and all people of goodwill. We are a welcoming congregation, a designation earned by our congregation and awarded by the Unitarian Universalist Association. It recognizes our work of being fully inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer individuals and their families. The second award from the UUA recognizes BUC as a green sanctuary congregation. We live out our faith through commitment to justice matters, including a focus on such issues as the climate crisis and confronting racism in ourselves and in the world. We look not at theological differences in our congregation as a problem. Instead, we encourage people of a variety of beliefs and philosophies to participate fully in the life of our congregation. Before beginning our service, we want to highlight announcements about upcoming events in our church. For additional information on becoming involved in BUC, please check out our website at bucmi.org. And we do have one announcement this morning. We have more of the We Believe rainbow colored yard signs available for sale for $25 each. These signs are a beautiful and powerful way to demonstrate our values. Jane O'Neill is coordinating orders and collecting payment by check or cash, or you can pay via Venmo to at BUCMI. Contact Jane to order and to make arrangements. We extend, of course, a special welcome to those who may be visiting BUC's worship service for the first time. We encourage you to stay with us in virtual mode following the service and participate in the discussion coffee hour following worship. And now, with music, our service begins. Good morning. It's good to be with you today. The prelude this morning is a mazurka by Francisco Tarrega, a late romantic composer, and he's considered the father of the classical guitar. In solidarity with Unitarian Universalist congregations here and around the world, we light our chalice, symbol of our faith, with these words by Linda Barnes. Suspended between all that was and all that might be, we struggle to find this very moment, to live this very moment. Let us sit together for a moment and savor this moment. Let us relish this between time where past meets future. Let us harbor a faith that reminds us 
that right now, right here, is enough. Our first hymn this morning is number 86, Blessed Spirit of My Life. stewards of this community and of our beautiful campus in stewardship in the best sense of that word all of us who came here as young people wanting our children to be able to grow up in a liberal faith community and now we can look at our grandchildren and we hope we'll grow up in a liberal faith community so even when we are not worshiping on site we are still responsible for expenses like utilities, lawn maintenance, and monthly leasing fees for the copier, the postage meter, and we pay for Zoom too. This is a house of memory and hope, of love and justice. Let there be an offering to support this beloved community. Your contribution can be sent to us using Venmo username at BUCMI or through our website. Giving through either platform is easy and free. You can also put a check in the mail to us. I ask you to consider how much you've relied on BUC in the past three months and do what you can to support our good work. Please give generously. The repertory song this morning is a tune from the 90s many of you will recognize, originally recorded by Wilson Phillips. I know this pain. Why do you lock yourself up in these chains? No one can change your life except for you. Don't anyone let ever double over you Just open your heart and your mind Hey, is it really fair to feel this way inside? Oh, someday somebody's gonna make you wanna turn around and say goodbye Until then, baby, are you gonna let them hold you down and make you cry? Don't you know, don't you know, things can change, things will go your way If you hold on for one more day Can you hold on for one more day, things will go your way Hold on for one more day You can sustain, or are you comfortable with the pain? You 
got no one to blame for your unhappiness No baby, you got yourself into your own mess Letting your worries pass you by Oh, don't you think it's worth your time to change your mind Whoa, someday somebody's gonna make you wanna turn around and say goodbye until then, baby, are you gonna let them hold it down and make you cry? Don't you know, don't you know, things can change, things will go your way. Maybe hold on for one more day. Can you hold on for one more day? Things will go your way. Hold on for one more day. I know that there is pain, but you hold on for one more day. Break free from the chains Yeah, I know that there is pain But you hold on for one more day And you break free, break from the chains And someday somebody's gonna make you wanna turn around and say goodbye Until then, baby, are you gonna let them hold you down and make you cry? Don't you know, don't you know, things will change Things can go your way if you hold on for one more day, yeah. Can you hold on? Can you hold on, baby? Hold on. Just hold on. Each Sunday, we set aside time for our congregants and guests to express their joys and sorrows. By doing this, we further develop opportunities to become a more cohesive, blood, uh, beloved community. Today, we have two joys and one issue of concern. The first joy is from Joanne Humphrey. Joanne would like to share the joyful news of the birth of her 30th great-grandchild. His name is Daniel Arthur Hupp, Jr. Congratulations to parents, the great-grandparent, and Daniel himself. From Kay Rittinger, Kay writes that I have a joy. My arm is healing even better than expected after a second surgery. Thank you to all the BUC people who brought the meals and have driven me to important appointments. I am very grateful. And the issue of concern comes from Gloria Abrams. Gloria writes that my husband is having a hip operation on Monday, August 3, that's tomorrow. Please keep him warmly in your hearts. The joys, concerns, and sorrows touch us all. May you be assured that we hold you, whether your joy, sorrow, or concern has been written and spoken or not, we hold you securely in our hearts. Let us join together in a moment of silence. In the spirit, spirit of life and love, in the silence, in the stillness, we hear the call of our own heart, its tender dreams, its sorrows and triumphs. In the silence and the stillness, we hear the whispers of days gone by, of dreams becoming the promise of the future. We celebrate together our individual journeys and dreams and our collective ones, knowing the journey is so much richer with others to share it. Let me be reminded that in, is in these moments of holding on that I can find quietude and renewal. It is within these times of inaction that I can find rest. 
It is in these times of emptiness that I can become full. In the name of all that is holy, we pray. Amen. confluence of crises that we are living in. I feel like I am on Mr. Toad's wild ride, holding on for all I am worth in the face of uncertainty. We are all holding on in the best sense of those words, because holding on means persistence, enduring. Holding on is not an act of desperation, but a realization that this one act is how we get through these times. We may not know how the wild ride will end, but holding on is how we get through it, how we endure. Writer Cameron Bove looks at holding on another way in this excerpt from her essay, The Power of Holding On. I believe in the power of holding on. What do I mean by holding on? It's the quiet but powerful moment we share when we hug. It's the current that runs from my heart to yours when I want to say something and words just won't do. Hugging or holding on is the power we possess when we put our arms around someone. It can change relationships, makes a patient a person, an acquaintance a friend, and bonds a child to a parent. My grandmother taught me about holding on whenever she gathered me in her strong, loving Irish arms. She always hugged like she meant it, even when her back became curved and her strength had waned. My mother hugs my children the same way, heart open and arms wide, breathing them into her soul. For me, holding on has become more than a physical interaction. It has become a way of thinking. My fallback answer to life's dilemmas and tough choices, it's an amalgam of acceptance, forgiveness, and patience. Not always easy or understood, but it guides me to be quiet and listen, look for the good, have a sense of humor and laugh, stop worrying and be patient, because if I let it, something will change. I've often wondered how different my life would be if I hadn't learned the power of holding on. If during that time in my life, when I was crumbling into myself, my mother had stopped holding on to me. I might have missed something so vital in my existence. I believe that a hug is like a battery charger. A good one can keep me going for a long time. Next time you're at your wit's end, start a trend, ask for a hug, and see if you can feel the difference. It's beautiful. Now, I personally do love a heartfelt hug. As Cameron Bove said, it's the current that runs from my heart to yours. And I miss it in our new reality of physical distancing, but the intention is still there. When I get to see your faces, your smiles, and each, each Sunday, thankful for the time we get to spend together. It is how we all share in holding on and holding each other up in this beloved community. 
E.E. E. Cummings said it so beautifully in his poem, I carry your heart with me. In the final lines, he writes, here is the deepest secret nobody knows. Here is the root of the root and the bud of the bud and the sky of the sky of a tree called life, which grows higher than the soul can hope or mind can hide. And this is the wonder that's keeping the stars apart. I carry you in my heart. I carry it in my heart. on anxiety will be those of an amateur in the field of phobias and fear. I am not a psychologist, nor a psychiatrist, nor a psychotherapist, just an observer and participant in the culture of our time. So let's begin with a fairly clear observation, at least clear to me. It is that social change can be very dislocating, a trigger for anxieties, fears, phobias. For that group of some people, their wish might be for happiness if only things could return to the ways they were when the some subclass members were young. My impression is that society has been in constant change with two relatively recent changes, the fastest in the history of humankind. I refer to the Industrial Revolution and then the Computer Revolution. Of the first, the Industrial Revolution, remember what we read in history courses about the Luddites? Those in Great Britain who tried to protect their jobs by destroying the new machines that were taking away the only ways of earning a living they had ever known. The term Luddite comes from a Ned Ludd, supposedly a weaver apprentice who destroyed a machine that would make him jobless. But like the story of Robin Hood, the story of Ned Ludd and the Luddites may be more apocryphal than real. There are many stories about similar anxieties in the 18th and 19th centuries. One that I love is about a race between a horse-drawn carriage and a carriage moved by a steam engine. The steam engine huffed and puffed while pulling away from the starting point, but it ultimately caught up with the horse-drawn carriage as it and the steam engine moved down parallel tracks. But before the steam engine could complete the run, the mechanical problems forced it to stop. Now about the second revolution, that of modern technology. I, re I well recall the technology that was available to me when I began to teach high school English history and music. In those days, technology was the typewriter and blue ink from the ditto machine, and black ink on the hectograph with the times, more black ink on one's hands than on the copies of the master itself. Several years earlier, we learned of the power and effects of atomic bombs. And then came television with its test patterns and professional wrestling and sets run by vacuum tubes. And shortly after that came the explosions of data mining with commercial and personal computers. We have been living through rapid change that can be problematic for some and anxiety causing for many others to absorb. 
One month ago, I wondered about the effect of newspaper headlines on readers and the extent to which they might encourage anxiety. And here, taken from the Royal Oak Tribune, the Detroit Free Press, New York Times, are a few of those Sunday headlines. Global virus shines light on local problems. At Mount Rushmore, Trump digs deeper into nation's divisions. Update. Michigan, 5,972 deaths, 65,533 cases. I just updated that. Now it's 6,206 deaths and 82,356 cases. Demanding an end to racism and police violence. Michigan educators support opening but have worries. German forces fear inroads by neo-Nazis. Virus inundates Texas, fed by abiding mistrust of government orders. And in a show of force, U.S. sends carriers to the South China Sea. Now, each of these headlines preceded an article of several paragraphs or of an entire page. We are presently in our own age of anxiety. People are fearing the coronavirus, fearing if symptoms will result in hospitalization, and if that, will they as patients recover? Others are fearing job losses and hopelessness about jobs returning. Now we also have anxieties about the rights of minorities and the Black Lives Matter movement. The new anxiety is whether or not statues of Southern Civil War heroes of a lost cause should be maintained in place or in museums. Gun violence in this country is always fair game for debate. And we are living now through one of the most divisive periods in the history of our country. A new book by Scott Stossel, who is the national editor of the Atlantic Monthly, is entitled My Age of Anxiety. As the title suggests, it's a personal confession about a man who is highly successful in his field, though he has some outrageously severe symptoms and episodes of anxiety. He writes about his age of anxiety. Stossel writes early in his book that Quote, there is a vast uh, encyclopedia of fears and phobias and anxieties, some you've heard of, others you probably have not. And then he lists some of them in a catalog that includes the fear of cheese. That's turophobia. Asthenophobia, the fear of fainting. Emetophobia, the fear of vomiting. And one of my personal favorites, claustrophobia, the fear of being in an unclosed space. Uh, the last one is my not so secret anxiety. Stossel admits that the rational side of the brain should be able, if only logic were to prevail, to handle or at least to minimize these fears. At a rational level, he knows he should not fear vomiting because his last experience was way back on March 15, 1977. But he does fear recurrence. And emetophobia is alive and well in his catalog of anxieties. But with all of these issues and even more, his colleagues and friends have always thought of Stossel 
as unflappable, a person who handles stress easily and with grace. Well, how can that be? He admits that he is always internally flapped. I'm reminded of an image that's become a fairly well-known story, but I first heard it from my graduate advisor. Edward, he said, be like the duck. The duck appears to be serene, graceful, and thoroughly enjoying his float across the pond. But under the surface, that duck is paddling like heck. Well, perhaps the duck is always flapped while appearing otherwise. Stossel, a professional at the top of his career, is resigned to having no cure for his phobias, at least not now. So why should he still worry about vomiting when his last episode was 43 years ago? Isn't it time to get over it? A question so quick on the tongue, but impossible for him to achieve. Although he has learned how to be good in hiding his fears from others, his mind and body tell him his fears are real and are continuing. But he's also learned to live with them. His book is not only entitled My Age of Anxiety, but the extended title after the colon is Fear, Hope, Dread, and the Search for Peace of Mind. Yes, peace of mind. One of those universal human searches. And there you have his end point, his conclusion. One thing Stossel has learned is that we all have anxieties to one degree or another. The trick is to recognize that anxieties can be diagrammed on a bell curve. The line begins on the left side for those with too little anxiety. Yes, too little. Such people barely recognize the need to rise in the morning. They are completely satisfied with everything as it is. No complaint here. And on the far right of the bell curve are those with so much anxiety that they want to stay in bed because it's so difficult to face the world of problems and fears. In the middle are those at the top of the curve, those who have anxieties that are manageable those who get out of bed because they have things to do and they believe they can or possibly might be able to do them. They are coping with the complexities unlike people at either end of the line. Stossel is not and feels he never will be cured. But he does hope that he can cope, and he sees that somewhere out there is peace of mind. He has been helped by traveling through the land of genetics, of using therapy, of using such prescriptions as Xanax, and recognizing the daily reality of his love of family of his wife and his two children. He has learned to hold on, and he's learned the values of mutual sympathy. And now I bring you to the actual source of the title of this sermon, The Age of Anxiety, not just anxiety, not a history, not an autobiographical confession, and not a smattering of headlines. The age of anxiety is a long poetic study of Western culture 
written in 1944 and 1945, published in England in 1947 and in this country in 1948. It is a poem responsible for W. H. Auden's award for the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. When Auden was writing this poem, World War II was nearly at an end, and he seems to be asking, what's next? Alan Jacobs, the most recent editor of the poem, begins his introduction with this hint of an answer. The age of anxiety, he says, begins in fear and doubt, but the four protagonists find some comfort in sharing their distress, in sharing their distress. In even this accidental and temporary community, there arises the possibility of what Auden once called local understanding. In the age of anxiety, three of Auden's key terms are parts of the monologues in this book length poem. They are comfort, community sharing, and local understanding. Certain anxieties may be overcome not by the altering of geopolitical or even individual conditions, but by the cultivation of mutual sympathy. Perhaps mutual love, even among those who hours before had been strangers. Wow. Mutual love. Such a simple phrase for such a powerful feeling. Well, four characters are in this poem, The Age of Anxiety. I remember it was written before the Second World War ended. Malin is a shrewd and knowledgeable observer of life, and he seems to represent thoughts of the poet himself. In part one, Malin meditates on the image of man in a bomber flying over enemy territory in World War II, dealing with death on countless people below. Now, some of you will remember pictures of a plastic bubble below the body of American bombers. In that bubble sat a man with a machine gun, the man whose job it was to kill before he was killed. In the poem, that man is Bert, the greenhouse gunner. Here is the meditation that ends with his thought that becomes a chorus in the thoughts of others. That chorus line is, many have perished, more will. Untalkative and tense, we took off anxious into air. Our instruments glowed dials in darkness, for dawn was not yet. Pulses pounded, we approached our target, conscious in common of our clothes here and of them out there, thinking of us in a different dream, for we die in theirs who kill in ours. We began our run. Death and damage darted at our will. Bullets were about blazing anger lunged from below, but we laid our eggs neatly in their nest. A nice deposit hatched in an instant. Houses flamed in shuddering sheets as we shed our big tears on their town. Enemy planes appeared. We fought them off but paid a price. 
there was pain for some. Why have they killed me? Wondered our Bart, our greenhouse gunner, forgot our answer, then was not with us. Many, many have perished. More will. The second reading is a progression of Malin's meditation near the end of the poem. It comes from the poem's sixth part. Focusing on, of all things, the difficulty of change. Do we learn from the past? The police, the, the dress designers, and so on, who manage the mirrors, say, no! A hundred centuries hence, the gross and aggressive will still be putting their trust in a patron saint or family fortress. We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. And there you have it. The need to evaluate and adapt to change in our age of anxiety. The antidotes, the antidotes to Auden's pessimism reside in those wondrous goals of comfort, community, sharing love and being loved and local understanding. To those antidotes, I add, be or become engaged, engaged in life and in the reality of truth and the sacred search for individual and societal improvement. Now, how do I cope? Well, I play golf. Not well, <laughs> but I play golf. And I enjoy the company of friends on the golf course. I walk around the neighborhood. I listen to favorite music. We would do well with our own anxieties in these threatening days to consider coping strategies and then to find our ways of living through these difficult times. It can be done. Stossel and Auden give not cures for anxiety, but at least it's a start. May it be so, and amen. Please join in singing our second and last hymn, I've Got Peace Like a River. I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I got peace like a river, I got peace like a river, I've got peace like a river in my soul. I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. Oh, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain, I've got joy like a fountain in my soul. I got love like an ocean, I got love like an ocean, I got love like an ocean in my soul. Oh, I got love like an ocean, I got I got strength like a mountain like a mountain in my soul. Oh, I got strength like a mountain. I 
I got strength like a mountain in my soul. I got peace like a river in my soul. Hold on to what is good, even if it is a handful of earth. Hold on to what you believe, even if it's a tree that stands by itself. Hold on to what you must do, even if it's a long way from here. If you have known love, give some back to a bruised and hurting world. Be well, and amen.